Georgia, and we're glad to have you today as we prepare for our first webinar. CPNG is a statewide organization of navigators who are here to help patients navigate the continuum of care. We do support patients, caregivers, as well as their families. Before I get into an overview of today's webinar, I'll do a few housekeeping items and then tell you a little bit more about what to expect today. Everyone will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions or technical issues, please just chat us and we'll be sure to assist you. The chat is located to the right of your screen in the control panel. Um, there you can type a question and we'll be able to see it and assist you there. You should have received a pre-test before the webinar that we'd like you to take. If you hadn't taken it already, it should only take about 30 seconds to a minute to take the pre-test. After the webinar, I'll send an evaluation and also a post-test so that we can measure how effective our webinar was today. All right, today's webinar will address financial toxicity in many different ways that we can address it amongst cancer patients and their families. It will be moderated by Tamara Mason and Lauren Liverman and Denise Paris will also join us. They are navigators at local hospitals within the Georgia area. I'll now pass it over to Tamara. Thank you, Katrina. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here, and thank you to Cancer Patient Navigators of Georgia, Georgia Carr and Gasco, for hosting this inaugural webinar series about this very important topic, cancer toxicity, as it's related to our cancer patients. I did want to provide a little bit of background about myself. My relationship with the Cancer Patient Navigators of Georgia started over a decade ago, actually, when I was involved with the inception and founding of the organization and has served as an education co-chair for CPNG from 2009 to 2014. At that time, in my previous public health position, I was the director of a late patient navigation program that focused on reducing morbidity and mortality from breast cancer among unserved women at a large public hospital here in Atlanta. I'm no longer in that role, but I do firmly believe in the concept of patient navigation and how it can assist all patients as they journey through the cancer care continuum. So I still have a passion and dedication to the concept of patient navigation and CPNG. In general, I have over 15 years of both public health and education experience. I say that I'm a consummate public health educator and have designed, implemented, and evaluated a variety of health education programs for underserved communities. I have a master of public health degree from Emory University. That's what actually brought me here to Atlanta 18 years ago, even though I'm still 14. And I also have a bachelor of arts degree from Brown University. And on a personal level, I'm a proud wife and mom who, unfortunately, I don't get to read, dance, and travel as much as I would like, but I do enjoy those things. As Katrina mentioned, we will also have two co-presenters with us this afternoon. Ms. Lauren Leverman, who is a licensed clinical social worker at Piedmont Athens Regional, and Ms. Denise Powers, who's also a licensed clinical social worker at Floyd Medical Center. They will both share several patient stories as related to our topic of financial toxicity. This afternoon during the webinar, we're going to define financial toxicity so that we're all on the same page as related to that. Then we will talk about financial toxicity and the concerns that cancer patients in particular may face. And then as mentioned, both Lauren and Denise will then share several patient stories slash, slash case studies as related to financial toxicity. They will also, while they're discussing their patient stories, talk about strategies that they have used to reduce their patients' financial concerns. And then we will wrap up the webinar by talking about various state-based resources to reduce patients' financial concerns. And we will really wrap up the webinar by opening it up for questions from you all. So as you may know, financial toxicity is defined as a high price of cancer care, along with the anxiety and the suffering that those financial burdens may cause our patients. A study that analyzed 42 clinical trials that were approved by the Food and Drug Administration between the years of 2006 and 2015 found that drug costs range from a monthly high of over $5,000 to up to $45,000. And in that same time period, it was also found that the average monthly cost 
of drugs raised within a decade from over $7,000 to over $15,000. So as you can imagine, drugs with that high price sticker prices can put a dent in anyone's family budget and particularly cancer patients as they're juggling competing financial priorities in terms of can I afford my medicine, can I afford my treatment, or can I make my mortgage or rent payment. Another study of over 9.5 million people diagnosed with cancer found that over 40% of patients said that they had used their entire savings and assets within two years of being diagnosed to fund their cancer care. So as we mentioned, the very high price of these cancer drugs that can exist in combination with the additional out-of-pocket expenses that our patients now have to cover, including higher co-pays, higher premiums, and higher deductibles. Again, all of that really puts a dent in our patient's budget. And it's been found that patients who have high out-of-pocket costs due to their cancer care, they may choose to forego treatment. Again, if I'm deciding whether I can pay for my treatment or I can pay for my mortgage, sometimes treatment may lose out. I may either not take my treatment at all because I can't afford it or not be as adherent and take half a dose to reduce the cost. And lastly, it's also been found that cancer patients face a nearly threefold increased risk of filing bankruptcy. And for our patients, our cancer patients who do file bankruptcy, they are at an increased risk of 79% more likely to have mortality from their cancer as compared to cancer patients who don't face who don't file bankruptcy at all. So we can see that the financial concerns of our patients really make a difference in their livelihood, both in the financial end, but also in terms of their quality of life. I really like this conceptual framework of financial toxicity that's adapted from Carrera et al., a study that they did in 2018. And according to Carrera et al., they break down financial toxicity into two components. So they say financial toxicity is based on objective financial burden and a subjective financial distress. And if you look at the third rung of the chart, the objective financial burden is really more so related to the direct cost, the direct expenditures of cancer care that our patients are exposed to, which relates to, as you see on that final rung, as we talked about the high price of drugs and then other treatment related costs. So as you all know, as our patients are going through their cancer journey, a lot of times their expenditures are increasing. And then as related to the wealth in their household on that second run of the chart, so as they are increasing their expenditures as related to their cancer care, the wealth in their household, which consists of wages, salaries, and savings and assets, that's decreasing over time because you're taking money out of your wages, your salaries, savings, and assets, et cetera, to pay for those increasing expenditures. So that's the objective financial burden. And then the subjective financial distress, as described more on this slide, is due to what we just talked about, the fact that the cancer-related expenditures are increasing over time, but the patient's wealth is reducing over time, and then the anxiety and the discomfort that that causes patients, as we can imagine. And one of the main outcomes as related to financial distress for our patients, as we talked about before, is medication non-adherence. And then also, as we can imagine, patients who feel distressed about their finances, how are they going to fund their cancer care, that affects their well-being and quality of life. Specifically related to cancer patients, uh, there are two studies that were conducted in 2013 that looked at what happens with our patients as they have these financial burdens and financial concerns. So Zafar et al. in a pilot study in 2013, over 200 patients, 42% of them who had solid tumors and re were receiving chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, they reported that they had significant or catastrophic financial burden from the out of related pocket, out of pocket, excuse me, related expenses as related to their cancer. And another study that was also conducted in 2013 by Layton et al., particularly among lung and colorectal cancer patients, found that 40 and 33% of them said they had limited financial reserves within two months or less of being diagnosed with their cancer. And when those patients were compared to other cancer patients who had more than 12 months of financial reserves, our patients with the limited financial reserves reported significantly increased pain, greater symptom board burden, and the poor quality of life. So that study in particular, it shows you directly how the financial concerns 
the financial burden that our patients may be experiencing, it's directly related to their morbidity and the experience that they have as a cancer patient in terms of how they feel physically. So we now have a quick poll that we'd love for you to engage in. A very simple question that we think we know the answer to, but we still want to put it out there. And we would like to know, are financial toxicity issues and concerns common with your patients? So you will choose one of the responses and press submit. We're going to give you 30 seconds, and then we will, in brief, discuss the results. Fantastic. In terms of thank you all for responding, and it's pretty much what we assumed. Um, I didn't know if we thought 100% of you all would say that you've dealt with financial toxicity issues concerned, but that makes sense, right, while you're on this webinar and trying to get some additional strategies. So thank you for answering that very simple poll for us. Okay, moving forward, we're now going to have our licensed clinical social workers come on and share their patient experience. And first we'll have Lauren Liverman, which she's an oncology social worker at Piedmont Athens Regional, and she's going to share a couple of her patient experiences as related to financial toxicity. Lauren? Thanks, Tamara. Um, thank you so much for having me on this call, this webinar. It's a great opportunity. For us to talk about this, as you just pointed out, this um, issue that faces all of us who work with cancer patients. So my uh, first case is, um, and actually both of these cases are recent patients that I interacted with um, because, you know, we interact with these patients really every day. Uh, so this patient is a 56-year-old woman who lives in Monroe, Georgia. So um, we have a, a lot of patients that come to us from the Walton County area, and depending upon where they live, it can be anywhere from half an hour to about 45 minutes away from the hospital. Um, she was receiving her chemotherapy treatment here at our ambulatory treatment center, um, which is basically um, an outpatient infusion center located here in our hospital facility. Um, she was referred to receive her chemotherapy here at the hospital because of her payer status. She um, is uninsured, and so sort of the, I don't know that it's a, it's a written policy, but what it commonly happens with our uninsured patients is they will be referred um, from the clinic, from the medical oncology clinic, to come to the hospital to receive their treatments. Um, I think some of the reasoning behind that is uh, um, the hospital incurring or absorbing the cost of that treatment uh, as opposed to the clinic. I also do know that our hospital systems tend to get um, chemotherapy drugs and other medications at a reduced rate compared to out outpatient clinics. So there's a little bit of um, a differential there. Um, so this patient was driving um, and she was going to be coming every day um, for a week to treatment. And she could have been getting her treatment in Monroe at um, her medical oncology practice. Her physician um, actually does see patients in, in Monroe, Georgia. They have a clinic um, there that is not based in sort of a local hospital. Um, however, because of her insurance status, they were not able, not willing, unsure of that specifically, um, to treat the patient there. So she was having to um, incur additional expenses not only just coming to get the treatments, but then the gas in her car, the wear and tear on an older automobile. So I, I noted here sort of downstream expenses um, that often our patients encounter, or sometimes, you know, I think of these as hidden expenses, the things that we don't think about, um, you know, that, that come up quite frequently. So my work with her involved um, getting her um, applications for financial assistance with Piedmont Healthcare, and, um, as well as some, some local financial assistance programs that assist with various needs, including transportation costs, 
Um, and then also given that it's time for open enrollment, having her connect with a local healthcare navigator who could help her determine what, um, if any, health insurance she might qualify for right now. So that's, that's my first case. And then, uh, Tamara, thank you. <laughs> um, so the next patient is a 65-year-old gentleman from Hartwell, Georgia. And he was in the hospital due to um, increasing difficulties due to progression of his pancreatic cancer. Um, he received one chemotherapy treatment as an outpatient and had a, a very, very difficult time tolerating it. And that, of course, led to his, um, his hospital admission. And his medical oncologist was considering um, immunotherapy as a treatment with the thinking that he might be able to tolerate that a little bit better than the chemotherapy drug. The patient is Medicare only, which um, most of the Medicare patients that I see and we see here um, tend to only have, um, have Medicare and no supplemental policy. So, um, and his Medicare was not gonna cover the recommended immunotherapy. And the patient was able to tell me or found that from his physician that this, this medication was going to cost $45,000 per treatment. So the patient account rep, um, and this is all through the patient, uh, told me that the patient account rep at the medical oncology practice was exploring um, patient assistance programs to see if they could assist him with the cost of that. Um, the patient was really kind of reticent um, really to even undergo this, this, this newly recommended treatment. Um, he certainly understands the gravity of his, his disease and, and prognosis. Um, but really one of the things he said was that he didn't like the idea of, of not being able to cover the medications that he needed. He, you know, he was, um, you know, a, a proud person who wanted to be able to take care of himself. Um, and, really just was not entirely certain that it was going to be worth pursuing this. Um, he was also just concerned with tolerance for the immunotherapy um, and deciding if this is really, you know, worth going through, particularly at that expense, even if he was able to get assistance because of, you know, what he knew to be his ultimate outcome. So those are just two of many, many cases. I Just this morning, I see patients in our radiation oncology clinic once a week, and, and I had a conversation with a man who is a small business owner and who's been unable to work because of his lung cancer diagnosis. And when he doesn't work, there is no income. And, you know, this is somebody that I'm, you know, going to be providing some food from our very small food pantry because, you know, he's, he's food unstable right now. Um, on top of everything else. So this is just a, it's a catastrophic problem that our patients face. Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing those different patient stories and perspectives. We'll now have Denise Powers, who's a licensed clinical social worker as well at Floyd Medical Center, specifically a service navigator. And she will share a couple of her patient stories and strategies she's used to assist her patients. Hi, this is Denise Powers. I work with Cancer Navigators here in Rome, Georgia. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that only helps cancer patients. We help with resources, renewal, and reassurance. Almost everyone who walks in our door needs help whether it's emotional or financial or resources. Um, I'm going to share two stories, and they're just two of many. Every day, people walk in desperate about financial toxicity issues. They don't know the words for it, but that's what it is. I had a 51-year-old African-American female who was diagnosed with bladder cancer in our community. She was, um, she had no insurance. She was sent out of town because she had no insurance and because there was no one who could perform the complicated and extensive surgery she would need. 
She had this surgery back in April of 2019. Surgery resulted in a lengthy hospital stay and a urostomy. While in the hospital, they applied for disability for her. She was, however, discharged from the hospital with no income, no insurance, and no source of urostomy supplies. She was not scheduled for any follow-up care, but told to see her urologist here in Rome. She was not willing to see the urologist because she had no money and had not been able to return to work. Someone told her about Cancer Navigators, and she scheduled an appointment not knowing what we might be able to do or how we could help her. We were very concerned about her because she'd been out of the hospital two weeks and no follow-up had been scheduled. She had no urostomy supplies, no income, and her Medicaid hadn't come through. She'd also been losing weight. We were troubled that it had been a long time since she'd seen a physician and she was in pain. She refused to see another doctor until she had insurance. She might have only had an eighth grade education, but she was so determined not to incur medical debt. We were able to send the Social Security adjudicator some more information on her physical and um, mental health condition, and she was quickly approved for SSI. As a result, she was able to secure a family practice doctor and start care for her bladder and severe psychiatric problems. Unfortunately, by the time she made it to the oncologist, it was five months post-surgery. At this point, it was unclear about the benefit of chemotherapy. She was given further scans to stage her cancer, and as it turns out, will require further surgery to remove other small tumors. She's been told that after the surgery that chemotherapy will be tried. This is an example of the results of financial toxicity among the uninsured. And on top of this, I didn't add that she had been, um, had two kids dropped off on her in the meantime. Two grandchildren dropped off on her. Just That just added to the complexity of this situation. It was a very complex situation. She was able to get some mental health treatment, and she is uh, doing much better. And she comes to see us and comes to our support group every Friday. And we see her often in the office. I have another patient that I wanted to tell you about. She came to us on a referral from the breast center. She was initially diagnosed with breast cancer stage 4 at the end of 2018. She's 74 and has a 74-year-old husband. This couple is traveling over 50 miles one way from Alabama. They have insurance. The couple has chosen to obtain their care here after they had met the medical team and developed confidence with them. They unfortunately realized that Harbin is considered out of network. And they're very concerned about the financial implications for their family and how they'll cope with this unexpected diagnosis and treatment. Their sources of income c consist of Social Security and a small pension. And their income is less than 200% of the poverty level. And they have very little retirement savings. 
we were able to help them in a, a number of ways. We were able to find gas money, which was critical for them, from various local and national resources. We have a food pantry here in our town that helps with food for cancer patients, and they are quite generous. They will take people from out of state, and they will help them. Um, and they can come twice a month. This is something that our organization set up with this food pantry. We've given them, ha we gave her hats and wigs as she dealt with the disfigurement of the chemo and the surgery. Um, we helped link her with the Harbin Financial Reimbursement Agent so that medication grants could be obtained. We helped them to get a charity write-off from the hospitals. We helped them get some other grants. And we helped them with the emotional support that it required for her to make it through this journey. She comes and talks to us about her feelings related to her illness, the meaning of it all, how she's been able to try to maintain her sense of privacy and how her story is presented. And she's coping with the side effects and issues regarding her self-esteem. She has touched us all. Everyone in the building has been touched by this woman. That's why we chose her to discuss. And the latest news is they're not sure if her treat if they will be able to find a resource next year for her patient assistance program for her chemotherapy. So financial toxicity hits the people with no insurance. It hits the people with some insurance, and we're here to kind of see what we can do to make a difference. That's it. Thank you so much, Lauren and Denise, for sharing those very poignant stories. Um, I really like how both of you they can seem sad, sad stories, right? And in the sense that they are, but really how both of you focus on the strategies and the resources that you use to assist the patients because there are resources out there. And so that's what we're going to talk about next in the presentation. So both Lauren and Denise mentioned several of these strategies, um, but we did want to go over them in brief. So applying for grants, as we heard both Lauren and Denise do, and actually on the next slide, we have um, a number of organizations where you can apply for grants for, organi for your patients to reduce some of their financial burdens and financial costs. Again, as we've mentioned throughout this presentation, the fact that the cost of cancer drugs can really be so prohibitive and very high. And so there are a number of pharmacy assistance programs that that's their primary purpose to reduce the cost of these drugs. And some of these programs are on a national level and a state level. And then also a lot of drugs are, excuse me, a lot of the manufacturers of the drugs themselves, they also have programs where they offer coupons or reduce the cost of the medications for the patients. So you wanna check into the manufacturer or encourage your patients to check into the manufacturers of the drugs as well. Again, as we heard both Lauren and Denise mention that transportation, our patients need to get to their appointments. Um, and if they don't have a way to get to their appointments, they're going to need help with gas money, gas cards, gas credits, um, also, or just a ride. So on the next slide, we'll talk about a couple of organizations that provide that type of assistance. And then also as related lodging, as we heard, and I think both stories from Denise and Lauren, patients traveling over 50 miles one way to get to appointments, to get to medical centers. So at times they may need you know, a place to stay overnight as they're recovering from the treatment that they've received. So there are resources as well that can help reduce some of the costs with that. 
And both Lauren and Denise mentioned connecting the patients to support groups. So while yes, it is very important to give the concrete resources to reduce the, the actual financial costs for our patients, the other piece of this financial toxicity equation is just the mental stress, the mental anguish that this costs. And so it's very helpful for our patients to be connected to a support group where they can talk amongst other patients who are going through similar things and just sort of, you know, release that burden, whether it's just for an hour or so to know that they're not the only one going through this and can receive support from folks who are in the same situation. And then going back up to the top of the slide, um, really encouraging and empowering, I'd like to say, our patients to, which can be difficult for our patients to discuss medication costs and financial costs with the healthcare team up front. Unfortunately, as we know, a lot of times our physicians, our MDs, they're, they're not taking the lead in this conversation. So really trying to encourage and empower our patients that they do have the right to have these sorts of financial conversations with their providers. And then lastly, which I think is something many of us may not necessarily think of, but health insurance companies, they can be our friend. Um, so if our patients do have insurance, encouraging our patients to reach out to their health insurance company to see perhaps can they be on a different type of insurance plan where they have, you know, a lower premium, deductible, lower copay, because all of this makes a difference in terms of it can reduce your costs. And as we know, every little bit helps. And lastly, as related to the insurance, as much as possible, if we can encourage our patients to receive treatment, receive care essentially within network because as we know within insurance that those type of providers are going to be cheaper than if a patient goes out of network. So before we get to some of the direct resources, we did have one more question for you all. And this time we're gonna use a chat feature. And so we'd like to hear from you, what are some of the strategies that you've used as a patient navigator to help reduce your patient's financial concerns and financial burdens? So your chat feature is right there in your control panel and you're just gonna click on it and, and type your responses right in there. Great, someone just mentioned that triage cancer is an awesome resource for patients, fantastic. Anyone else with any other resources or strategies that they'd like to mention? Okay, well, thanks so much. If you do have any additional resources or strategies that you'd like to share, you can write it there in that chat box. So on this slide, we have a list of resources. So as we mentioned, and both Denise and Lauren mentioned, pharmacy assistance programs, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. And again, those programs reduce the direct cost of the medications that our cancer patients may experience. So there's a program called the Georgia Drug Card, which is specific here to Georgia. That program is pretty much accepted at all pharmacies here in the state of Georgia. I do believe CVS is a preferred pharmacy, but again, it is accepted at Kroger, Walmart, any of the other pharmacies here in Georgia. And again, that's going to reduce the pricing of the medications that our patients may need. And then the other websites are more national resources um, that you may or may not have heard of. So Needy Meds, GoodRx, Rx Outreach, Medicine Assistance Tool, and then the last one, Need Help Paying Bills, is really more so about, as it says, <laughs> paying bills for the patients. So please access any of those resources, again, to reduce the cost of medicines for your patients and then getting them assistance, paying mortgage, rent, things of that sort. And on the right side are a list of organizations. So of course, we first want to mention the Georgia Center for Oncology Research and Education. Um, using that web link or just going to the 
Georgia Corps webpage, you can find a variety of resources that provide financial assistance to patients. And so using that link, actually, you'll be able to see all of these resources and many others. But we really want to recommend Georgia Corps as the first place that you go to to find out information about financial assistance programs and other resources for our patients. The Georgia Department of Public Health, they also have a variety of financial assistance resources for patients. Um, and that particular link, when you go to it, it lists like over a dozen organizations that do a variety of financial assistance program for patients. So you definitely want to check that out. And then, of course, I'm sure many of us are aware of the American Cancer Society. They have a variety of financial assistance programs. And then in terms of transportation, they have their Road to Recovery program, which provides free rides to patients for treatment. And then their Hope Lodge, which is a housing resource and provides free housing for patients as they're getting treatment. And I believe um, it's not listed here, but I believe Airbnb also provide free housing free Airbnb housing for patients who are receiving treatment. So that's something that you possibly can just Google um, and get more information about that. And then the last two organizations listed on this slide, they're general organizations that they provide financial assistance, both in terms of medications and also, again, some of the other financial issues, priorities that patients may have, like mortgage, transportation, things of that sort. And then lastly, we did want to mention, we talked about it a little bit when we we're discussing the strategies that I really do think as navigators, when we're discussing financial toxicity, but just in general, it's really a perfect time for us to encourage and empower our patients that they are the primary advocate for themselves in their health care. And as related to that, to take the lead, which I know can be difficult for many of our patients, but to encourage them to take the lead on having the conversation with their providers about how much their treatment is going to cost. So this slide, these seven questions are actually adapted from the American Cancer Society, where they, it provides a guide for patients when they are having that sometimes difficult conversation with their providers regarding the financial concerns they have as related to their treatment. This is a list of references that we used as we were developing this presentation. Feel free if you want to de delve more into this topic, you can read all of those articles in depth or just get more information. And then now we're going to open it up for any questions or comments that, again, you can use in the chat feature. Okay, we have some additional suggestions from the audience regarding resources, such as Women's Health Medicaid, the Road to Recovery Program, which I believe we mentioned, and the Northside Hospital has an insurance program. Thank you for those suggestions. And Denise and Lauren, did you all want to chime in in terms of any resources specific resources that you all use. I think a couple of people um, were asking what are the exact financial assistance programs that you all use? Um, cancer care um, is very helpful for breast cancer patients at this time. The what is available at any given time varies week to week. And you kind of just have to check and see because sometimes Cancer Care has transportation money for all cancers, but at the moment, it's just breast cancer. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Denise. Lauren, uh, we, and, oops, sorry, go ahead, Denise. I was just going to say that the um, Susan Komen uh, is not active in our community, but for people who come to us from Alabama, we can apply for grants for transportation for, from Susan G. Komen out of Alabama. Uh, we're in a little hole that is just not covered by Susan G. Komen. Um, 
As are we, Denise. <laughs> really? Coma doesn't cover you are too? Coma doesn't cover the Athens, Georgia area either. Oh, okay. Doesn't cover yeah. Athens either. Didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, Tamara, um, one of the most common resources that I and, and other social workers in our area use is the Cancer Foundation. Uh, it previously was known as the Cancer Foundation of Northeast Georgia. It is a financial grant program um, that, you know, the, the money is raised locally and it's provided locally for patients undergoing cancer treatment. And uh, it's just been a terrific program. Um, they're incredibly responsive. I'm, I might, sub excuse me, I have an application to submit for a patient this afternoon, and, and I will probably hear back from her by the end of the day, if not tomorrow morning. Um, and all eligible patients are accepted. It's five, excuse me, it's $500 annually, and it can go to a number of different expenses. Um, the most commonly utilized resource is gas cards that are provided, um, and it covers a multitude of counties in the Northeast Georgia area. Um, it goes as far west as Gwinnett County, which is somewhat unusual because, you know, Gwinnett's really kind of falls in the Atlanta catchment area, but we are able to help, excuse me, the, the Cancer Foundation is able to help people in that, in that county. Um, so that's just been a terrific resource. Um, I've personally worked with the staff over the years of the foundation and they, um, what that can often do, even though, even though we know as practitioners it's a stopgap measure, um, I think what it does psychologically for patients to have something happen and happen quickly um, that helps address an immediate need um, really can be, um, you know, so encouraging and helping them feel like that there might, you know, there might be something to be hopeful for in terms of getting um, the financial assistance and financial stability that they're needing. So it's a great resource. We yes, also, thank you so much. We also help people apply for uh, grants from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Frequently, they've got transportation money available. Not always, but that's just for your blood cancer patients. Um, we've also um, used the Blue Note, Blue Hope um, grants for colon cancer patients. We've used angel wheels for transportation for long distances, like the people coming from Chattooga County or um, Polk County or Alabama to treatment. Sometimes we can get help for those folks. And it's, it's a thing you have to kind of dig for all the time. We're, we spend time every week looking and updating our resource list. For that Absolutely. Reason. And within the webinar, um, there are actually two handouts with a listing of resources. So please access those and print them out. And uh, several of these organizations that you all have mentioned, thank you, Denise and Lauren, and that a few others have mentioned via the chat feature and questions are listed on that resource list, but in addition to many others. So um, please do access that. We wanted to mention also that sometimes we just talk about juggling your finances. Um, if you not, if you can use the food pantry, even though you've never used a food pantry before, it will free up some money for maybe a copay or maybe gas money. And so we talk about kind of juggling things. Absolutely. I think that's a great point, Denise, that honestly, all of us, whether we're cancer patients or not, right, can pay attention to our budget and just see where can we move things around to cover costs. But definitely when you are a cancer patient, that, that may be even more pertinent. Okay, if there are no more questions, concerns, or comments, we would like to thank you all for participating in the inaugural Cancer Patient Navigators of Georgia webinar series. There will be additional webinars, um, so please look out for that. 
Uh, our contact information is listed for all of us. And again, Katrina Mitchell is a primary Georgia Corps CPNG contact and her information is listed as well. So I'm gonna pass it off to her for her to conclude this webinar. Thank you so much for spending your lunch with us. Thank you so much, Samira, and also Lauren and Denise. I hope that everyone learned something that you can apply to your roles. Um, that is our mission here at CPNG. Um, so that's what we try to deliver in the programs that we're providing to you. Immediately after the webinar, we will send a post test as well as a short evaluation so that you can give us your feedback on our webinar. Um, this was our first webinar, so we really do want to hear your feedback and let us know how well we did. Um, lastly, the webinar will be available on georgiacancerinfo.org within the week. It'll be on the navigation section of that website. And we'll also have the handouts available there as well so that you can download those, print them, and share them with your colleagues. Um, my information is here. If you have any suggestions for future webinars or in-person meetings, please let me know. We do welcome your feedback. We hope that you have a great day and we'll speak to you soon.